Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Carol Fletcher, and Jeff Cook is also leading in worship today as we gather in God's name. We begin today welcoming you to Transcona Memorial United Church and inviting you to join with us as we acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. We are gathered for worship and work in Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. For thousands of years, Indigenous people have walked this land and knew it to be the center of their lives and their spirituality. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I invite you to join with our music team of Cheryl Jackson and Crystal Shaw as we stand as we are able and sing our intro, which is the fourth verse of Jesus Christ is risen today. We join in singing.
I invite us to join our opening prayer and find the words in the book. Let us pray. Holy God, you invite us to follow. You invite us to live as your disciple. We gather as your people this day. Be with us as we hear your word. Be with us as we extend our love for others as you would have us. Help us to live grace and care in all we say and do. We give thanks and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. Jesus said to him, follow me. Levi got up, left everything, followed Jesus. Then Levi gave a great banquet for Jesus in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to Jesus' disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, those who are well, have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And may God speak to us through these words of Scripture. Amen.
Happy Mother's Day. As Carol said, Mother's Day brings lots of different feelings and experiences. For some, it brings memories. For some, it brings cards, flowers, perhaps meals. But Mother's Day has an interesting history because the origins of Mother's Day have less to do with appreciation for mothers and more to do with mothers offering the world a new vision of how the world could be, particularly through the works of two women. One was Julia Ward Howe from the United States in the 1870s. She created what she called a Mother's Day Proclamation. She called on mothers of all nationalities to do to promote what she called the amicable settlement of international questions. You won't find that in a lot of Mother's Day cards. <laughs> but basically she said, I'm calling on mothers to call for peace in the world. There's another woman, Ann Jarvis, who during the American Civil War made it her responsibility to tend for wounded soldiers, whether they were Union or Confederate, didn't matter. And she began what she called Mother's Day work clubs saying there are health care issues in our society and we need to address them. And those two women together, Ann Jarvis and Julie Ward Howe, called for the creation of a Mother's Day for Peace. And they wanted that to be a day for mothers throughout the world to say, we do not want our husbands and sons to die in any more wars, in any more battles. So Mother's Day for us in that history reminds us that it's about a vision. It's about a vision of how the world could be. We sang color outside the lines, and those words I'll speak about, there could be a different world outside those lines. Open the door crack and see something. Open the blinds a bit and see the world could be different than what it is. The author Frederick Buechner sometimes talked about a dream he has where he's in a high-rise apartment, he looks down the street, people are all pointing out, and he can't see what it is, but they see something they're very excited about, a new vision. And we know about visions and being called outside the line, visions, dreams, Martin Luther King. I have a dream that one day slave, former slave owners and former slaves can all sit down together, their children at one table and be together. We have a rainbow candle, color outside the lines, to invite us to see the world, to say that sexual identity, gender identity, gender diversity, those are part of God's creation and who we are as human beings. Desmond Tutu, during apartheid, talked about South Africa creating a rainbow society where everybody is honored and welcomed. And in the Bible, there are poets, we often call them prophets, who constantly are offering a vision, a dream, a different way to be. One of those was Isaiah. And he said, you know, one day, one day, God's going to bring all the nations together to settle all of their arguments. And you know what they're going to do in, on that day? All the nations are going to bring their swords and their spears, and they're going to bring big hammers, and they're going to bring some anvils, and they're going to start hitting those swords and spears, and they're going to make rakes, and they're going to make shovels, so we can go out and plant and grow food to feed one another. And they're going to go to workshops while they're there, and they're going to learn to make war no more. And then God's going to invite them all onto a big mountain. And you know what God's going to do? This is the important part to remember for what's coming later. God's going to invite them to a big banquet. And all the nations, everybody, will come to a fine feast of food. The prophets, the poets of the Bible, offer these visions. Bear that in mind as we turn to our gospel lesson about Levi. We're told Levi is a tax collector. I think we need some historical context because there are tax collectors. We all have to pay taxes for a variety of reasons and probably with a variety of feelings about paying taxes sometimes. <laughs> but for the Jewish people in the first century, paying taxes had other significance than what it does to us because they were people living in an occupied country under the rule of the Roman Empire. And there were a variety of taxes. Rome allowed local governments to look after the taxes and local dignities. There was the temple in Jerusalem and the high priest was told, you have to collect the taxes to maintain the temple. But when that temple was destroyed, 
in the first century, just shortly before this gospel was written, then those taxes didn't go to the Jewish temple. They went to Rome, to the temple of Jupiter, to one of the Roman gods. The Jewish people are paying taxes to support the temple of the gods of the nation that has conquered us. And there were taxes for people who traveled carrying goods. So you would have tax booths set up at ports, at the main crossroads of roads, and coming into cities at the city desk. And they would charge you a percentage for whatever goods you were transporting. And that's likely what Levi was doing, sitting at a tax booth, collecting taxes from those who were traveling, a fee, a toll upon what they were transporting. And Levi probably was somebody who, in that time, as a Jewish person, had applied to be a tax collector. And once accepted, he had to pay the annual tax himself and then collect the taxes and added a little commission for himself so he made a living, which actually is probably fair enough. Everybody has to make something. But the other thing about those taxes that when you're paying with Roman coins is most of the Roman coins bore the image of the Caesar, the emperor, and words that would say, this is the son of God or this is God. But for Jewish people who worship God, Yahweh, taxes were not just something to support infrastructure. Taxes were a con constant reminder that there are other gods, other empires ruling us. They had to do with theology. And they also knew that they were supporting the Roman Empire. They supported infrastructure. Rome had great roads. For one thing, you could transport goods for trade, but Rome had good roads built by their army, because Rome put their armies around the edges of their empire. They needed to know that if there was trouble, they could move their troops from point A to point B and know exactly how long it would take to net up roads. Good roads, well-maintained, taxes to keep the army in business. So that's part of the context. This is Levi. As you might guess, the Jewish people tax collectors were not real popular. They were collaborators with Rome. They weren't the people, somebody going in the state says, tax collector, can we get a selfie with you? <laughs> people avoided them. And then Jesus comes and sees Levi at the tax booth and says what Jesus says to lots of people who become disciples, follow me. And Levi gets up, leaves the tax booth and goes, we don't know why, curious, local celebrity, something in him feeling I'm isolated from everybody else. Maybe Jesus invites me back into the community. Maybe there is a world I know this system isn't working and Jesus can be a part of helping me be a part of it. Whatever it is, Levi follows. Jesus offers an invite to Levi, follow me. And then Levi offers an invite to Jesus. Come to a banquet at my house. You've been listening. Banquet, Bible. Whoa, Isaiah said something about it. Banquet in the Bible says something about God is up to something here. Banquet says something about God's vision of humanity and who we are. We suddenly moved into God's stuff here. Levi throws a big banquet and invites other people from the office. There are other tax collectors there, we're told. Tax collectors and others. It's a mixed group. And then there's a couple of categories of people listed in Luke's gospel that we might be surprised you. There's some Pharisees and scribes. And Christians always need to be careful because we tend to hear Pharisees and scribes and get very, oh, they're the anti Jewish people. Pharisees and scribes are very important people in the religious tradition of the Jewish people. Pharisees were a lady woman trying to make their faith practical to people, to create disciplines that people could follow to be faithful. And when the temple was destroyed and it was no longer there, it was the movement of the Pharisees that in many ways allowed Judaism as we know it to continue and to thrive. And the scribes were the ones who studied the laws and the scriptures. They're religious people. 
What they serve in this story is not to say heresies and scribes are bad. I think they serve to say attitudes that lots of people can take towards faith in Jesus and religion may not be the attitude that Jesus calls us to. Because they complain to Jesus' disciples. What is Jesus doing eating with those people? Because they're not the people we would eat with. They're the tax collectors. They're the collaborators with the Roman Empire. Remember the coins? They shouldn't be part of our community. He's eating with tax collectors and sinners, all the wrong people. The people who don't buy into our religious program. People who don't agree with us on the issues in whatever part of history you are in, in the church. There are always issues either agree on or disagree on. And it's an attitude, I think, that says, moves from saying, we serve God to saying, God's real purpose is to say, you're so good. You got it right. I bless you because you're the people who really show everybody. Jesus hears the complaints. And he says, people who are well, don't need a physician, don't need a doctor. Only the people who are sick, who are ill, who are out of sorts. I've come not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. To repentance, to turning around, to repentance, repentance, which I would say is to reimagine the world as how it could be if it's the way God wants it to be. I call those people to repent, to enter into a new vision, to hear different poetry, to discover a new narrative, not the narrative that locks us in the lines of how things have to be in our economic systems or our relationships, but a new narrative of God's world. And that narrative has to do with everybody gathering at a table and everybody being fed. Now, if I'm one of those scribes and Pharisees, I might walk away from there and think later, I'm righteous, I'm righteous, wait a minute. Jesus didn't come to call the righteous to follow. But if God is calling the righteous to follow Jesus, and I think I'm righteous, and God is talking to me here, and suddenly I'm the one who's outside. That God thing. I'm the one who's got listening to my music and I've got the big earphones on and I can't hear anything outside those lines. I can't open any other doors to see something of a new possibility. I've only got one narrative. Jesus says, look at this. Look at the banquet. Look at the table. Look who's here. And yeah, it's complicated and yeah, it's difficult because these people have a lot of differences. But somehow God invited all of them to one table. This isn't about how we've proven to God we deserve to be here. This is about God loving us and inviting us here. Henry now and the Dutch priest often talked about the struggle he felt in his own life between wanting to be loved and wanting to express God's love. And he once said, you know, it really isn't about how much attention we get, how much popularity we get, how much affection we get, how much power we have. It's about how we each manifest, embody, share, express God's love in our own lives. That when we see the banquet, it's not about let's analyze who's right or wrong, who belong. It's about somehow God is present at this table with everybody. And how in the sharing of that food is God present? And in our world today, with all its conflicts and struggles and brokenness, it's still a difficult message because it's still that vision that we want to glimpse and hear and work towards. How do we become embodiments, expressions of peace? How is God's love shown in us? And it means sitting sometimes with people we don't want to sit. There's a, a movie, um, I saw part of it on the airplane, was traveling, called It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. If you haven't seen it, just hearing the title, you know who it's about. It's about Fred Rogers. 
the children's entertainer. He was also a Presbyterian minister. And movies about an event that actually happened is like 1988, a writer for Esquire magazine named Lloyd Bogu, who in the movie, his name is, but for it is Tom Genova, is asked by his editor to write an article on Fred Rogers, an article that would appear later under the title, Can You Say Hero? But this writer was a writer who liked to write exposés, liked to consider himself a hardcore journalist, liked to go in and find a clay feet to tear people down, to show that these are not people that should be idolized. She said, you're going to go write an article on Fred Rogers. And you bring some nice. And in the movie, he shows up at the studio, and Fred Rogers sees him, interrupts the taping, he goes over and says, this is Tom, he's a really good journalist. He's going to spend some time with me later. And later on, Tom is sitting with Fred Rogers' manager, and he says, I guess when Fred accepted me coming to interview him, he really didn't know anything about me or what kind of journalist I am. Manager says, he read everything you had written when the invitation came in. He says, you're here because you're the kind of person Fred likes. And slowly he comes to realize that the kind of people Fred likes are the kind of people who sometimes find it hard to like themselves. The kind of people Fred likes are the people who he knows bear the image of God, but somehow are disconnected from that image in their own lives. The kind of people Fred likes are the ones that he has to somehow call upon God's love in himself to help him to life. The kind of people Fred likes are the ones that, like him, are on a journey of healing. Jesus accepts the invitation to the banquet because Jesus knows this is Isaiah, this is God's stuff, this is the vision of a world. This is a narrative that's different than the narratives we hear. This is a narrative in which everybody matters. This is a narrative about a world that could have peace, that could have reconciliation, that could have rainbow people and societies. This is a narrative about a banquet. This is a narrative of scriptures where being called to follow God is called into communities of passion for the poor and the excluded and the vulnerable. This is a narrative that talks about a God who's involved in a narrative of exile and homecoming, of healing, of sharing, of forgiving, of sometimes dying, but even in that death, trusting that God's power of resurrection and new life is possible. So on this Mother's Day, as we celebrate mothers, let us also know that we celebrate a new narrative, a narrative that invites us to say, let us call for a world of peace and an end to war. Let us gather for worship knowing we gather because it offers us a new narrative about everybody being invited to a banquet, an odd banquet, God's peculiar banquet that God's peculiarly loved people. Thanks be to God. Amen.
said amen. <laughs> Our uh, time of prayer today unites us with other United Church congregations around the country as we use words adapted from words written by Jackie Harper, a recently retired United Church minister who published these prayers uh, for us to use on this particular Sunday, uh, which is for many a Christian Family Sunday, recognizing that it is Mother's Day and that not all of the, of the joy that some have is shared by all. And so we think about how we come together in prayer. I'll remind you that you are invited to pause where you are at 6 p.m. this evening and every evening to join with the people of this congregation and so many other congregations, 6 p.m. in each worldwide time zone to offer a prayer, let there be peace on earth, as we hold in our hearts the people of Ukraine and beyond, the refugees around the world, all of those seeking right relationships from here at home around the globe. Let there be peace on earth. As we come to our time of prayer today, let us pray. God of Mary and John, 
called to be in called to relationships that stretch beyond blood to care for one another you invite us to to reach out and welcome support and care for one another god of the past god of the present god of tomorrow help us to live in relationships that seek justice love kindness and ground ourselves in your love for us hear our prayers oh god for people far away for people close in our hearts hear our prayers oh god for this hurting world hear our silent prayers and those prayers that are sighs too deep for words as we continue in prayer, saying together the words that Jesus taught his disciples, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We close our worship service singing. It is found, a uh, hymn found in more voices, number 209. Go make a difference. 209 in more voices. Let's go into the world 
to extend to all people an invitation to God's amazing banquet, the banquet that holds the hope of peace, reconciliation, and new life. Go in peace and in love, in the name of God who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us this day and always. Go in peace and love. Amen and amen. Thank you.